Hey there. So in this video, I'm going to be talking specifically about the new features that are going to be coming to JavaScript in 2021. Now, before I dig in, please go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm going to go ahead and move directly into what we're going to be talking about in this video, which is the five new features that are pretty much guaranteed to be in JavaScript in 2021. There's more that are in the works. The way that it kind of works is there's several stages that a feature has to go through before it's actually put into the specification. And right now there's only five that are in stage four, which in stage four, that basically means it's completed. It's going to be, unless something goes horribly wrong, it's gonna be in JavaScript. In fact, I can already use these features anyway by using node 15 and I'll be demoing a lot of these features in this video. So, and explaining how they work and that sort of thing. When there's something cutting edge like this and I wanna talk about it, I like to go to the source. I found a couple of blog articles, but nothing really consistent with the information. So I've decided to just go straight to the source here. I'm on the GitHub page for the proposals, and this is the finishedproposals.md for features of JavaScript ever since 2016. Now, as you can see here, this lists a bunch of different features that have come out over time. We just wanna focus on 2021 for now. And so right here is where we're gonna start. And we're going to start with this new string.prototype.replaceAll method. Now, I think everybody in their JavaScript career has at least used the replace method on a string at least once. So what does this look like? Let me pull open a file that I'm just going to call script.js and I'll zoom in so it's easy to see. But let's just say we have a string here and it's called, it just, the value is hello world. Now, if we wanted to replace L in this, to say console.log um, hello world, but we wanted to replace say the first L in this with a one or a capital L. Let's go with capital L. We could say console.log str.replace and we could replace string with, or we can replace L, let's say lowercase L with capital L. Now, depending on how familiar you are with JavaScript, you may or may not know what this is about to run. So if I run this really quick, you can see that it lo it logs hello world and the first L is capital, but the rest are not. And that's because what this string.replace method does is it actually just replaces the first instance that it finds with whatever it you pass it in here. Well, that's great, but what if I want to replace every L with a capital L? In that case, you have to use a regular expression. So you would have to do something like this and you would have to pass in this global flag in order to say, hey, every single L we want to replace it with a capital L. So if I save that and run it, you can see that now every L in this is capitalized. Okay, but wouldn't it be great if I could just have a, like what if I don't want to write a regular expression? Wouldn't it be nice if I could just replace every instance of it natively in JavaScript without having to use regex? Well, now you can, and that's what this is. So if I get rid of this and just go back to the original example of this, log it, you know, it logs hello world where only the first L was replaced. Let me try the new replace all method. And just so you can see node dash V I'm using 15.0. That's why I currently have access to these features. But uh, if I, if I run this, you can see all of the L's have been replaced with a capital L, but there is one caveat to this, which is if I were to want to use a regular expression with replace all like this, take a look at what happens when I run this you can see we get a type error and it says it must be called, or it says that I did call it with a non-global reg regular expression argument, which means that we have to call it with this G flag here in order for this to work. And as you can see, it, that satisfies the requirement. So in other words, if you use replace all, you have no choice but to literally replace all. And that makes sense to me. So I don't really have any problem with that. So the next feature I wanna talk about is promise.any. So in other words, any is a new function of the promise class in 2021. Now, how does this differ from say promise.race? Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about promise.all first. So promise.all allows you to pass in an array of promises and once all of them resolve, then promise.all will resolve an array of results from all of the promises that you passed in. If any of them fail, you'll get an error message. In the case of promise.race, Let's hypothetically say we have five promises inside of the array that we passed of promise.race. Let's say three of them pass and two of them fail. In the order that they resolve, let's say the first one fails and then the second one passes and then the third one passes and then the fourth one fails and then the fifth one passes. 
Well, the, with the way that promise.race works, the very first one that finishes, in our case, it fails, it's going to then reject with an error about why that particular one rejected, and it's not going to care about the other four. Now, if the first one resolved, then the promise.race will resolve with the result from that promise. Promise.any is different from that. Let's say we have the exact same array of promises, three pass, two fail, in the exact same order where the first one fails. Well, what's gonna happen is it's going to wait for any of the promises to resolve. If any of the promises resolve, the first one that resolves, it's going to then resolve with that value. So in our case, that's the second promise because it's fail, pass, pass, fail, pass. So the second promise, it's going to resolve. It's going to say, okay, hey, now we have a value and then it's going to resolve with that value. But let's say all five of them fail. So if all five of these fail, what's going to happen is it's going to then say, well, none of them passed. And we're going to create an aggregate error, which is a combination of all five of the errors in one object. And it's going to reject Thus, you go into the catch with a, this aggregate error with all of the error information of all of the promises that failed. So in this case, with any, it's going to resolve with the first one that passes. Otherwise, if all of them fail, it's going to reject. Now, this third feature that I want to talk about is called weak refs and actually it comes in two parts because there's weak refs and then there are finalizers and they kind of have to do with garbage collection. Now, this isn't the type of feature that you're thinking of where you're like, I can create new features in my apps using these features. This is not recommended with weak refs and finalizers. In fact, these are not recommended to use unless you absolutely need to, even in the proposal. So weak refs, the concept is pretty simple, but the use case is extremely rare and again, very complicated and advanced. And you should not use them unless you know what you're doing and you know that it's the only way to do it. But the concept is this. Let's say you have an object and you have a reference to that object. Well, in pre-2021, any data structure in JavaScript says, if you have a reference to an object, then that object is gonna end up staying in memory. At least the value is going to stay in memory as long as that reference exists. So let's say you have a giant object and it's taking up a ton of memory and you want to create a reference to it, but you don't want it to, you don't want to force it to stay in memory. You want it to just live its own life cycle. And if you need it later on, if you want to access it through its reference later on, you can recreate this object so that it's not taking up all these resources and that sort of thing. Then you can use weak refs for that because it will create a reference to this object without forcing it to stay in memory. So the garbage collection can just come along and if it decides it wants to clean it up, it will without destroying this reference. Okay, so finalizers. Finalizers also has to do with the idea of garbage collection, but it's a little bit different in that you can use it for debugging and the concept is pretty simple, but again, it's advanced and not really recommended to use unless you know what you're doing. It allows you to kind of hook into the life cycle of the garbage collection process. And so let's say there is an object out there in cyberspace and the garbage collector is coming to wipe it out. Well, as it wipes it out, you can run a little bit of code during that process. Typically, and you're probably going to want to log something. So let's say you want to debug something related to the garbage collection collection process. You can then type in some information in the log. And then when it wipes it out, it'll run that code and you can see the logs. And, you know, that can be helpful for you in certain rare circumstances. So this feature is something that is probably pretty powerful in certain very specific cases. But again, you're not going to want to write any like application logic around these features and you're probably just going to use them for debugging. Or if you're really just trying to juice out the last bit of optimization that you possibly can from some sort of feature. So number four is logical assignment operators. And I'm actually really excited about this feature just because I'm kind of a JavaScript nerd. It doesn't really unlock any new features. Again, it's more of a convenient convenience thing and slight optimization, but it's cool because it will allow you to become a little bit more expressive with the JavaScript language. I think it was inspired a little bit by Ruby's language. And the idea is that you can take the operations or, and, and the nullish operator, which if you're not familiar with the nullish operator, it's the two question marks that determine whether or not something is null or undefined. I'll show you in a second on the screen, but you can short circuit using these operators. So you can put like A or B in there. If A is falsy in some way, then it's going to return B. So I'll show you in code right now what I mean by short circuiting. So the way that short circuiting works is pretty simple. 
you know the or operator and you know the and operators. We can look at the nullish one in a second. But let's say we have a variable that we assign here. Let's say const a equals false. Well, false is a falsy value. And so if we were to say console.log a or hello world, then what's going to happen is it's going to check for a value for a. And if that doesn't exist, it's going to short circuit and return this value instead. So if I run this, I would expect to see hello world logged to the screen and I do. Now the and case is actually the opposite. So if I put and in here, it's going to check for whether or not this exists. If it doesn't exist, it's going to actually return this. Otherwise it's going to return the other side. So it's the opposite of the or. So if I run this, you can see that it says false. So it returns the left side instead of the right side in this particular case. And of course, if I switch this to a truthy value, then it's going to log hello world in this case. And if I were to do or obviously it would, it would log true. All right. So the difference between the or operator and the nullish operator is that if I were to run this with the or operator like this, it's going to give me hello world because this is a falsy value. But the nullish operator, which is the two question marks, is similar to the or operator, but instead of checking for a falsy value, it's going to check specifically for null or undefined values. So if I run this, it's actually going to do false because false is not null or undefined. But if I put null and run this, now we get hello world. And if I run undefined, we also are going to get hello world. And that's all great. And these features have been available in JavaScript for a while now. However, now we're able to assign with these now. So we can add an equal sign at the end and perform some pretty concise logic. And I'll show you what I mean right now. So most people who have used JavaScript for a while already know that if you were to set something like let a equals two, and then underneath this say a plus equals two, if I were to console.log a, we would expect to see four, right? And we do, we see four. Now, that is because we're using an assignment operator, a mathematical assignment operator specifically. And we can take that same concept and now apply them to logical operators. And the logical operators are again, or and, and the nullish operator. So we can now combine that with assignment. So how would that work? Well, let's take a look. Let's say, let's say let a equals false. So we're setting a to false. Now, what if I were to say a or equals 10? What do you think it would be now if I were to log a? Let's find out. It equals 10. Now let's think about this for a second. If I were to just return, let's just say above this console.log a or hello world, just like in the earlier example, if I were to comment this out, what do you think it would log? It would log hello world. And that's because this is falsy, so it short circuits and then it returns hello world. Well, in the case of the new assignment, the new logical assignment operators, it does very much the same thing, but then it also adds a little bit of extra functionality on the end there. So A is falsy, so it's going to kind of short circuit and then assign, that's what this is, assign the value to the right side. So if I were to switch this to be true and run this again, you will see that the value does not get reassigned to 10 because it's truthy and it does not short circuit and assign. However, now, if you remember in the case of it being truthy and using the and operator, it runs the, it actually will flip over to the right side and short circuit. In this case, we would expect it to be 10. So again, the same thing with the nullish operator. If I set this to be null and then do the nullish operator here, if I were to log this, we would get 10. So really this is just kind of like shorthand for doing something like this let a equals null. If, if a equals null, then a equals 10. That's basically the same as, you know, doing a and then the nullish operator adding the assignment and setting it equal to 10. It's practically the same thing, although this performs more efficiently than this. It's also a lot easier to write. And in my opinion, it unlocks a new way for you to write certain things. And I just think it's cool. Which brings us to feature number five, and in personally my favorite of the five new features, although it really, again, doesn't add any new capabilities to the language in terms of functionality, 
but it does fix a problem that I personally have had and I know tons of people have had. And let me demonstrate what the problem actually is and then I can show you how this fixes it. So let's take a moment to console.log this number. Now let's have a look at this number. Can you tell me what that number is really quickly? Probably not because you have to count the zeros and when there's no commas or anything like that, in order to count these zeros, you have to like highlight it with your cursor. So you can say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros. And then you can kind of in your head rationalize what that number is. That's terrible, right? <laughs> it's th that's something that is kind of a pain in the butt. So if I were to log this, you could see it logs the number. And it, even when logging it, there's still no way to really determine easily what that number actually is. Um, so this new feature of JavaScript that's being introduced in 2021, also known as numeric separators, fixes this problem for us. So now we can add underscores without it actually affecting the value. So I can come in here and do this and I can easily see that this is 100 million now. I can look at this number and say, oh, that's 100 million. I instantly know, I don't have to highlight anything. I just freaking know that that is 100 million. And then if I run that, it doesn't change the value. So it's really just a syntactic thing that makes it really easy for you to read the numbers without it affecting the value. Now you can do that with normal numbers, just like we did right there, but you can also do it with like binary, hex, big int, octals, um, and just like those types of numbers. But uh, in my case here, this is really where it's important because I do see a lot of places when I'm reading code where there's just this massive number, you know, maybe, maybe it's that, or maybe it's like that. I don't know, but it'd be way easier to read that number with this new feature. And I'm super excited about that. So as you can tell, these new features in JavaScript don't really add too much to the language, but it does make it more enjoyable to code in. And that's really one of the most important things with JavaScript nowadays is how can we make the language fun to code in? And so far every year we've been getting new features that allows us to do so. Now, if you liked this video, please thumb me up, smash the subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all in the next video. Have a great day.